Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to our Bootform Zanzi Twitter Spaces session called Gather to Grow. I'm your host for the session. My name is Dawn Numdu. We're discussing a very hot topic tonight, and I'm very happy to have my speakers with me, joining me to share some insights and just to give an overview for farmers impacted by this foot and mouth disease, but also others in the industry to understand what's going on. I'm going to introduce my speakers and also ask them just to tell us a little bit about what they do in the industry and where it all started for them. It's always so interesting to find out how people got to the agricultural sector and what kept them here and what keeps them going day to day. I'm going to start with Dr. Mpomaja. She's an animal health director at the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. She's also new to Twitter Spaces, guys, so total newbie. But she's rocking at it. She figured it out and she's here to chat to us. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Maja. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Paul Maja. I'm with the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, formulating policies for controlling of animal diseases in general. Thank you so much. I now move over to Dr. Didi Klaassen. She's AfriVet's executive for technical support and for technical and marketing support. She's not new to this platform. She's been on a few of our spaces, and I'm so happy to have her with us as well. Just for people who might not know you a bit about yourself, Dr. Klassen, just to get the conversation going. Thanks so much, Dawn, and everyone listening. I'm with AfriVet. We're an animal health company. So what that means is we are in the pharmaceutical side of things. So we have dips and dewormers and vitamins and minerals that we sell, not only in the livestock sector, but also in the more intensive animal production sector, so chickens and pigs and dairies and then also we have a a companion animal unit and then where we work closely with government with Dr. Marja is with training services so there's a AfriVet training services where we get involved in training of the emerging pharma sector the commercial pharma sector as well as um, in industry and wherever they need us to help and then also where we can drive the initiative so training and then I want to say drugs for animals. Thank you so much for being here. On the 16th of August, Minister Tokudidiza suspended all movement of cattle in South Africa due to foot and mouth disease outbreaks. And the suspension was aimed at halting the continued spread of FMD. Maybe we can start with just a breakdown of the 21-day ban. What does it mean exactly when you're a livestock farmer in Mzanzi? Dr. Maja, would you like to take this one just as a spokesperson tonight for the Department of Agriculture? So what it means for the cattle farmers, because the ban does not extend to the entire livestock sector, it means that cattle cannot be moved from one property to another property unless it is going for slaughter straight to the abattoir. And for that, we require for the animals to be accompanied by the health attestation, which, by the way, is a normal practice. Everything that goes to the slaughterhouse should be accompanied by a health certificate from farm of origin. And then the state veterinarian will then issue a permit to accompany the animals to the abattoir. And we are hoping that at the end of the 21 days, we would be able to review and lift some of these restrictions. Thanks so much for Valarity and for sharing that information with us. Thank you so much for just giving us an overview. We're currently experiencing 116 FMD outbreaks involving farms, feedlots, communal areas in KZN, Limpopo, Northwest Gauteng, Mpumalanga, and Free State Provinces. I'm not sure if this has increased since the story was released on this through the department and uh, food from Zanzi. Is this the worst outbreak that we've seen in Mzanzi? And could we maybe just talk about how the outbreaks affects farmers in this region? Dr. Klassen, would you like to take this one? And I'd also like to get Mr. Dr. Maja to also, to also chat to us about it. I think Dr. Maja will have the latest figures with the number of farms affected. But to my knowledge, so my history with veterinary science goes back to 2009 when I graduated and even a bit before then. To my knowledge, this is the worst outbreak we have. Dr. Maja can confirm from the sort of history provided by the government blogs and history, if this is true. But um, in my experience, this is the worst outbreak we've had. Dr. Maja, what is your opinion on this? Is this definitely the worst outbreak? Yes. Unfortunately, 
sad to admit, but yes, it is the biggest outbreak that we have seen. Normally, we would have smaller outbreaks, especially what we call the foot and mouth disease protection zones. They do not affect trade. So they go to the general public unnoticed. We have not had such a big case or outbreak, what we used to call the free zone of the country. And secondly, that affects such vast areas and such a large number of properties and animals being affected. So it is the largest outbreak that we've had. Thanks so much for that, ma'am. I've just invited Duncan Masiwa, who is the head of news at Food for Mzanzi, to co-host with me. Because for some reason, my phone is doing Mojo Mojo stuff, so I can't hear anything that Dr. Maja is saying. But I don't want to end the space because we're already engaging on the topic. But my next question, while I figure out the technical aspects, is just to ask around, you know, the fact that foot and mouth disease is described as a highly contagious viral disease of cloven hoofed animals and livestock. How does the disease affect animals and commercial livestock in particular? Dr. Didi, would you like to take this one? And Dr. Marja as well for comment. Lesion and symptom-wise, as Dr. Marja said, you get different strains. So in other countries, in Asia and Europe, the lesions are quite severe and the animals can get quite sick. But as Dr. Marja said, in South Africa, the strains or the subtypes we have, the SAT 1, 2 and 3 viruses, do not cause as severe lesions. You might see bad lesions in the mouth and on the feet. That's where the name foot and mouth disease comes from. It might also go sort of subclinical. I think COVID taught us a lot about disease spread. So you had your subclinical cases of COVID where you couldn't see that the people were sick, they were healthy, but they actually had the virus. And the same thing can happen with foot and mouth disease. So you can have animals with overt symptoms where very bad oral lesions or lesions on the lips, on the tongue, or then on the feet. And they can struggle to walk. They can have secondary infections and fever. And then you might have animals that are spreading the virus and they have no symptoms whatsoever. And we now, in the commercial sector, they've been picking it up and they've been testing. But it's not only limited to the commercial sector. As Dr. Marjo also said, anyone who has cloven hoofed animals can play a role in the spread of the disease. But with our subtypes, cattle seem to be playing a major or a bigger role. And then, for example, the small stock or the pigs, but you still have to work with caution when it comes to the other species like sheep, goats and pigs, the other cloven hoofed animals. But the main focus will be on cattle and buffalo for the spread of all the strains we have in South Africa. Thank you so much, Dr. Didi. We have a speaker here at Ole um, Legeto. I see you joined. Do you have a question? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Duncan, for accepting my request to speak. I am a farmer, a cattle farmer from the Northwest Farm Information. Now, I today I saw there was a press release from the government of Botswana. They have a case that they are suspecting in some area of theirs. Now, immediately, they have released a statement to say they are stopping all movement of cattle in and around Botswana. Had our government done the same at the beginning of this crisis, when they had their first case, we would have not been in a situation where we are right now. Because what is happening now, farmers are losing a lot of money because we are unable to trade for a space of three weeks. I'm blaming our government for their lack of action that they failed to take at the beginning of this crisis. I wish you had invited somebody from government to come and speak here and come and answer questions from us. That is why there's a lot of outcry and anger from a lot of farmers, because they should have prevented this from the beginning. They should have taken measures from the beginning. Look at Botswana. They immediately they've got a suspicion of a case, and they take action. So it's very heartbreaking and very, very, very financially straining on us farmers. So I wish you yeah, had invited yeah. them so that they can come and, and speak to us and answer us. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks, Olele. And of course, we do have Dr. Marja from the department joining us tonight. I'm not sure if she'll be able to give you any feedback with regards to what's happening in Botswana. If you do have questions as a farmer with concerns to um, current crisis that we are experiencing in um, South Africa, of course, she is here. But Dawn, if you've joined us. Dr. Marja is the Animal Health Director at the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. So you can speak to her directly. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Marja, and being open to join the conversation. Would you like to respond to the farmer's question, ma'am? There is an English say that says hindsight is 2020. And that basically refers to the fact that 
if you had a foresight of what would happen, you would take different decisions when that situation presents itself. What I also find contradictory to what you are saying is that we should have put a country ban in place already way back then. But at the same time, you are complaining about the 21 days that we have now put in place. And I think that illustrates the fact that you never win. Whatever you do, especially as government, whatever we do, we will be blamed for it. It's right for this one. It's wrong for that one. I think what we now need to do is take lessons. We are where we are now. We are asking farmers not to move cattle. And there's a scientific rationale behind that. But guess what? It's the same farmers, Ole, that are moving cattle. It's the same farmers that are screaming and shouting at us, that are threatening to even kill us because we have suspended movements and because we are affecting your livelihoods, understandably. So my only response is we can only do what we can do, given the signs presented, and we are doing the best that we can do. And remember, similar to the response to COVID, government needs to balance the containment of a disease and the activities of commerce, economic activity. We moved from levels five to four, back to five, as the situation developed. And a lot of commerce was complaining because with lockdown, people couldn't go to work, their businesses were affected, restaurants closed, but it had to be done. There's only so much that can be done given the signs that's presented at that given time. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I hope that that answers your question, Ole. I see we have another farmer who'd like to engage. Ole, would you like to respond? Sorry, I don't mean this to be a debate or an argument, but I just want to add on to something that the doctor is saying. When we had our first outbreak from the red suit, why did they not quarantine and stop the area to say that in this district, nothing goes in and out? Make roadblock, invite, call the cops, call the soldiers, like they did with COVID. COVID, I mean, soldiers were helping because it was a national crisis. This is also a national crisis because it affects our human life. It affects the economy very bad. Why did they not do that? Yes, we are crying and we are saying they should have stopped. Why did they not do that? Thank you so much, Ole. And of course, this is an open platform. So anyone who would like to ask a question and speak, you're allowed to. And I think our speakers present will respond to the best of their ability as well and with the information that they do have. We have a number of questions based on the fact that we would like to share information with farmers about how to curb the spread and specifically around treatment methods. And I think there's a much bigger debate that needs to be done around control measures and other issues that farmers may have. So perhaps there's a chance for us to do a part two on this as well, to engage more with the representative from the department as well. Andele Matukane is also here. Andele, would you like to ask a question or raise a concern or comment on the topic? Hi, everyone. I just wanted to ask a question both to farmers and also Dr. Mpo. So my concern or question now is, especially to the farmers, should we now expect a price drop in the beef side? Or should we expect a price increase on the price side? For instance, after the 21 days, if they then allowed to sell or do the movement of the cattle, how safe will then be the meat that we'll be buying? And is then going to be a flood of beef since now they've been quarantined for 21 days? Dr. Marja or Dr. Clausen, any response on this? The nice thing with FMD is that it does not affect people. So as a consumer, you and I can happily still consume our beef. As you may have missed earlier response that I gave that despite the 21 days stand still, cattle can still move to the abattoir for slaughter. I normally joke and don't quote me to say that it looks like there was something that me as a meat lover had in mind when we gave that exemption. But on a serious note, that was exactly for that reason that you're asking, Andile, for food security. And also because animals that have been slaughtered poses a lesser risk in transmitting the disease because they are not going to another farm. So there wouldn't be any risk to the consumers. 
Unfortunately, I don't have any indicators with regards to the prices. I'll leave that to somebody else. I can just speak on yes, say regarding the prices, but what would happen with the feedlot not being able to get in new animals, there will be from a feedlot side, so not from the farmer sending animals directly to the abattoirs to maintain food security, there might be a slight drop. And then there's going to be a period where we might pay more for prices. So that's the rumors I've heard that we will first see a drop and then an increase and then it will stabilize again. So that's the rumors I heard on the street, but I'm not an economist. So also like Dr. Ma just said, don't quote me on this. Thank you so much to our speakers. I think this is a very hot topic. I don't even have to go through my list of questions that I usually have prepared. We have another listener wanting to join. Punzo, would you like to ask a question, react or comment on the topic? You have the floor, you can. I heard Dr. Ma just saying they learned something from COVID and, and, and everything like that. So we saw during COVID there was a bit of uh, compensation from government to people. I mean, there's still 350 at the moment, right? Do you have anything for farmers at this moment? Okay, thank you so much for your question. So you're asking about support. Dr. Marja, would you like to respond to that one? We don't have any support from the national office. We have programs, though, that the national office supports farmers, but through the provinces, some being cast. So farmers that require support need to approach their provincial departments of agriculture. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. My second question is based on can you tell how long the animal was or has been affected based on the severity of the symptoms maybe? I'm thinking if you can tell, then this can help to at least pinpoint where everything is coming from in the specific uh, infection. Dr. Klaas, would you like to take this one? Virus, we have, like I said, our specific subtypes, the lesions can be very subtle, so they can be there for a very short period of time. Even the quite severe lesions, we had a trial where we examining the sort of effects of foot and mouth disease and looking at some vaccines. And then we infected animals with FMD virus. And even before the trial was over, the lesions healed already. So the animals recover quite quickly, I think within a week. And that also makes it dangerous because if you don't look for the disease, you might miss it. But the animals can transmit the disease in this time period. And that's why we have this ban on movement. Dr. Marja can also comment if she wants to, but the ban is there because we don't always see the lesions. The lesions disappear very quickly, um, but the virus spreads quite rapidly, very much like COVID did. Before you realize what's going on, your farm's already infected. And uh, Dawn is probably going to get to how do we prevent this or treat this. Just the main thing is that we don't treat. You can give them a while we await um, slaughter. We obviously will give them palliative treatment to make them comfortable because they are quite sore. They get these ulcers in their mouths where the, the viral blisters burst or ruptured in between their feet so they can't walk far. So you make food available closer to them that they don't have to walk to the food water. And then you'll make the food softer because their mouths are sore. I know if when you bite your own cheek and you have the sore inside your mouth, um, whenever you eat or whenever you drink, it's really sore uh, or painful. So it's just to give that palliative treatment, but there's no specific treatment for foot and mouth disease. And then depending on the quarantine measures that the state vet imposes, it will depend on what the outcome of the animals are that were infected. But this is where Dr. Moja comes in. You are spot on, Didi. There isn't treatment. It's just to make the animal comfortable and so that it doesn't lose too much weight. Foot and mouth disease also doesn't kill. It rarely kills animals. So the idea is just to lessen their suffering. There is also vaccine available, which is government-controlled vaccine and activity. Like any vaccine, it is not a treatment, it is a preventative measure. I think some of our other listeners would also like to engage on the topic. I'm going to give Sizwe a chance. Sizwe, would you like to add a comment, say something, ask a question specifically related to the topic? Question to you, Dr. Diddy, something that's quite important, the issue of biosecurity um, at farms. You know, a lot of farmers have joined us here and probably some between small scale and commercial farmers. How can farmers improve biosecurity uh, at their property? And uh, Dr. Marja, of course, you're more than welcome to jump in here as well. So biosecurity, I think we can't reiterate enough when it comes to a disease like foot and mouth. I know we're correlating this with COVID the whole time, but I think COVID was a a good learning school for all of us. So 
we all upped our personal biosecurity in our homes when I remember in the beginning with stage five lockdown, we were also guilty of that. You'd go buy your food from the store and then you have this little corner in your kitchen where you sort of wipe it down and then you put it in the fridge. I would like vigorously wash my hands and sanitize my phone and you wear your mask and your hands are sore from all the washing because we all thought we were going to get very sick from COVID. So the same sort of principles stand for biosecurity on farm. And there's so many aspects to biosecurity that we can look at. So even if you want to start with simple things, it's like your fences on your farm or on your property, are they intact? Because if you don't have proper fencing, your animals can go to your neighbor and your neighbor's animals can come to your farm and then they can co-mingle. And it's sort of like a super spreader COVID event. You have a super spreader FMD event. Same if you move your animals to, let's say, an auction or you go buy animals from an auction and then you bring them back to your farm. They were at a super spreader event. Now you're bringing them back home or you're bringing new animals in and they can bring virus, any any disease, not just foot and mouth disease, but let's say brucellosis, TB. If you buy in new animals, you need to know what diseases are coming in. So do you have a quarantine facility for new animals or animals that left your property and are now back home? where you can keep them for a couple of days or weeks to make sure that they're not incubating a disease that can affect your animals. That's another form of biosecurity. People visiting your South Africans are extremely friendly and hospitable, and we like to invite friends over for a braai, etc. And then while they're there, you go show them your new calves, etc. But you don't know where that person was. And that could be your friend, it can be your dad, it can be your children. And it can be the veterinarian that visits your herd. So people coming onto your farm, you need to know where were they? Were they in contact with animals? If they were in contact with animals, what types of animals were they in contact with? Is there a risk of them bringing foot and mouth disease virus onto your farm? Because we as people can act as fomites with, let's say, for example, a stethoscope of a vet. If they touch an infected animal, the virus sits on that. And then you take it to the next farm or under your shoes or on the wheels of your car in the back of the vehicle you're transporting your animals on. So all of these things are fomites that can transfer the virus. So are you disinfecting people's feet? Are they washing their hands? Do you know where they're coming from? Are you disinfecting vehicles, their wheels, their tires? So another form of biosecurity, and this is not just for FMD, but are you vaccinating animals? And remember with FMD, as Dr. Ma just said, the vaccine is under government control. So not people in Cape Town, for example, can't vaccinate their animals. Um, It's not going to be allowed at this stage. But there are various mitigating factors you can do to safeguard your animals. For example, against brucellosis, you can vaccinate. So if animals come into your farm that have brucellosis, you decrease the risk of them contracting that disease. So that's a form of biosecurity. So the list goes on. It's literally what security measures can you take to ensure that diseases do not get onto your farm? And if they do, what you can do to safeguard your core herd. So that's biosecurity in a nutshell. Another thing I want to say, if you're going to buy disinfectants, I think we all saw that with COVID as well. Every disinfectant on the market apparently killed COVID. But make sure that the disinfectant that you buy is registered for foot and mouth disease, that you don't just go buy someone's marketing scheme to kill the virus, but that the, what you use, you use at the correct concentrations, you use for the correct time period. So sometimes they'll say you have to have contact with the disinfectant for 15 minutes. Then make sure that, that what you're disinfecting is in contact with disinfectant for 15 minutes. So follow the instructions, make sure it's registered for use for foot and mouth disease, and then make sure that you clean everything properly. But I think in a nutshell, make sure animals can't get onto your farm or off of your farm, know where they're going, where they're coming from, that you can quarantine them and that you disinfect the property or the elements coming onto the property thoroughly. That's the beginning of biosecurity. But I think that's also a farm space on its own. Very interesting topic, but something we need to focus on. Big topic, but very important, um, Dr. Judy Carson. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. You know, for the farmers who have, who have joined, we will be doing an article write-up on Food from Zanzi about this session. So if you missed anything what Dr. Didi, of course, just said, we'll definitely be doing um, a write-up about this session. Dr. Mart, but maybe there's something that you want to add um, to Dr. Didi said. I think Didi covered it very nicely. When I give presentations, especially to the farmers, to the lay people, I always make comparison with covid By the way, those are the things that we as veterinarians have been practicing all along. 
we just didn't call it social distancing. We had our different terminology, but it's exactly like that. So I don't have anything further to add. Thanks. Thank you so much. And of course, if you do have questions, um, you are more than welcome to um, request to become a speaker. And of course, don't we'll open the platform for you. But Dr. Marja, you know, Pole, do you have a question? Hi, Duncan. Sorry, man. I just wanted to add something earlier to what the lady Andile, she asked the question about how is this going to affect the prices of meat? Now, to add on to that, this is this is what is going to this is what happens. Every abattoir in the country, they've got buyers buying this C grade cattle for them at every auction. Uh, now, as a result, for the for the next three weeks, those abattoirs will not be having buyers for them. Uh, so it's now an issue of demand and supply. So for the next three weeks, the supply of meat, the demand of meat is going to be high. So there will be less supplies. So what is going to happen, the price of meat is definitely going to go up. And unfortunately, the people that are going to feel it is the consumers. The price of meat is definitely going to go up. And my, my, the, other, the other issue I wanted to raise is that also in terms of the A-grade meat, remember South Africa also imports a lot of A-grade winner calves from Botswana, from also from Namibia. Now for the next three weeks, the feedlots are not being able to get that meat. So they're going to have that gap. Also, now it's going to affect the price. And lastly, what I wanted to say, it's a pledge from us as farmers, especially I had the powers a bit concerned to say farmers are not complying. But it's a pledge. I, I would also like to urge every farmer that is on the space that is listening to say, let us pledge and not make this a government problem. As farmers, let us pledge to give, give, to comply and give support. And also to the law enforcement agencies. They must take harsh actions against farmers that are busy transporting cattle and all that. Because as far as I'm concerned, this has been gazetted. So it's a criminal offense to transport cattle during this period. Even us as consumers and as farmers, when we see somebody doing it, let's report those people because we will not be able to solve this crisis if we are putting petrol in a fire. That's just what I wanted to say to say. We are pledging our support to government. Dr. Majan need not be worried. I think also farmers that are on this space, we are young farmers and also that we are pledging our support. So that's all I wanted to say. Halala Ole for that comment and just, you know, reiterating that farmers want to work together. They want to make sure that they can continue to do their work effectively and productively and to the best of their abilities. I just wanted to say thanks for that comment, Ole. Yes, very encouraging, very Duncan. encouraging to hear that from a farmer, definitely. I have two more questions, and I think we have highlighted a lot of the talking points that I had prepared for the session, but I specifically wanted to ask about how the recent ban posing a threat to the beef industry. I think Ole has raised a lot of important points, but it's specifically around the country now losing its international FMD-free zone recognition and what that means. Just as a bigger picture, as we wrap up, I'd like to encourage any other farmer with more questions just to grab the mic and ask a question. Dr. Mojo, are you going to tackle the international trade question? Yes, the, unfortunately, foot and mouth disease, in as much as it does not kill the animals, it's a very trade-sensitive disease. So once a country reports it, trade partners immediately suspend trade. So what it means to the farmer at the moment is that there's a lot of commodities that we cannot export to our usual markets. The good news that we received yesterday is that we can now export wool to China. And this came at great expense, not financial, but time-wise, from government side in supplying information and trying to make the, the trade partner understand where the disease is, what we are doing as government to control it. And fortunately, it has yielded good results. The trade that is affected generally ranges from live animals to animal products, be it genetic products, semen embryos, or beef, dairy, wool that I've just mentioned. So unfortunately, the individual farmers do get affected with once a foot and mouth disease case has been confirmed. Thank you so much, Dr. Marja. Thank you so much for unpacking that for us. Of course, the unbanning of wool products from, from China, of course, was great news. 
that things are celebrated far and wide across all corners of South Africa. You know, we have you here. Maybe just give us a, a sneak preview into, you know, the behind the scenes as to, you know, some of the things that South Africa had to give to China in order to get to where we are today, which is, uh, you know, seeing the wool market being open again for, for South Africa. Of course, China, was, of course, is a big market for South Africa. 70% of our wool goes there. So maybe just give us a sneak preview into, into what was happening behind the scenes. So the information that we shared was generally what we share with the public, with our media statements, what we are doing to control the disease, that the properties that are affected are placed under quarantine. Animals cannot move into, out of, or through of those. And in areas where we cannot enforce quarantine, the entire area is placed under quarantine. We call those disease management areas, but the same principle applies. Over and above that, we are vaccinating affected properties. And if it is feedlots, they would be allowed to slaughter at a predetermined period once the infection is no longer active on the farm. And it's not because of food safety, but it's just to manage the risk of moving cattle from an infected farm to the abattoir and spreading the infection en route. Also, remember abattoirs collect or receive animals from other premises. So once infected animals are at the abattoir, trucks come in, they leave the abattoir, they go to farm B, exactly what Didi was saying earlier. And that could then transmit disease. And it's one of the reasons that we would not allow cattle, even if they are going for slaughter, from an infected property until we are satisfied that there's no longer infection on the farm. The other thing that we provided was the traceability system that the wool industry has. It's an industry-driven traceability system. They know where their wool is coming from bale by bale. They can show you who the farmers are, from which areas, and we could demonstrate that we know exactly what's in a bale, where it's coming from, when it was shown. And they accepted the guarantees and they could see that we are not sourcing wool from infected areas. So that was good enough. Thank you so much, Doctor. So, Bello, we have you also on speaker. Do you have a question, a comment? Um, you are more than welcome to unmute your mic. Good evening, farmers. Mine is a question around the status of some zones, especially in KZN, that were initially restricted, the animal movement. I think at the time, those municipalities or zones, everything that is Chauvin-Hooven, was restricted in terms of movement. Now, I wanted to check this new regulation. Does it override the regulations that were there specifically to those zones in KZN? Because I know most of small and substance farmers in KZN are trade on goats. And at the time, even goats were not allowed to be transported in KZN. So I've been trying to find out for some time now, what is the status of, of those restrictions? Because my understanding is that What's been gazetted is that is the movement now, what's been restricted is the movement of cattle, cows. If anyone can help me, I would appreciate that. The recent notice doesn't override that notice. Even in this notice, we do indicate that properties that are under quarantine remain under quarantine. With everything that's on it, be it pigs, be it sheep, it remains under quarantine. Similar to the disease management area, we call it in short DMA. All cloven hoofed animals in the DMA are not allowed to move into, out of, or through the DMA. So it does not override that. Those restrictions remain. Even when we lift the current cattle standstill, those control measures would remain. We will make sure that this time around, we cover it clearly in our media statements when we make that announcement. Thank you so much, Dr. Maja. Dawn, over to you. Thank you so much, Duncan, and thank you so much to our listeners and our speakers. We are nearing the end of tonight's conversation. Remember, if you have any questions, if you're a cattle farmer, if you're producing livestock and you want to ask a specific question, we have our speakers here tonight for that. Sabelo, thank you so much for your contribution. I think we've covered a lot of ground and a lot of the talking points that I've prepared. We spoke about end consumers and how this affects them. But I'd maybe like to talk more about, you know, our collective responsibility. I think Ole raised it earlier, you know, keeping each other accountable as farmers, as people working within the industry. What is our collective responsibility 
just as a final point, I see Funzo would like to also ask a question. So maybe we'll take Funzo first and then we'll ask our speakers just to respond around, you know, our collective responsibility with dealing with this crisis because it's not just aimed at farmers and government to respond or handle it. So it's just a follow-up uh, on all this statement about reporting illegal movements and stuff like that. So a person see that happening, where do you report? Is there a channel maybe directly for this or is treated as any wrongdoing in, in the country? Dr. Mark, I'm sure you will be able to answer that question. And, and Dr. Dida, I'm not sure if you are aware of any channels that you know farmers or members of the public could report that. It should be reported to the state vet office nearest. Their contact details are on the department's website or to stock theft. Remember, SAPS police services have a special unit that deals with livestock thefts. So they are also assisting us with the monitoring and the enforcement of the notice. So those are the two avenues where reports could be directed to. Awesome. Anything from your side, Didi? I just also want to reiterate what Ole said, that we, the public, because I'm a member of the public, have the responsibility to report cases. Or if you see something happening, even if it's cattle in a truck moving, you don't know if they're going to an abattoir. We assume they're going to an abattoir and they should have a Red Cross permit with them and a health attestation if they're moving. The police can't be everywhere. The stock theft unit can't be everywhere. But if we can keep our eyes and ears out for this 21 days, of which a week is basically passed already, I think we have that responsibility as citizens to play our part almost like a community police forum just to make sure that our commodities are protected um, by reporting cases that we see. Thank you so much, Dr. Klaassen. And that actually answers the last question that I had around, you know, what is our collective responsibility? If we'd like to know more about, you know, the treatment methods, we have done a lot of this on our Farmers Inside Track podcast. Dr. Didi Klaassen was featured on that around what to do when your animal is affected. But maybe just as we close, Dr. Klaassen, just to what happens when you suspect that your animals are affected with FMD, just you have to put them in ICU, do you separate them? Just a few tips on that before we close and give over to Dr. Marja for the last comments. Go onto the website, the National Department of Agriculture website and look who your state vet is. Even tonight, even if you don't have foot and mouth disease, even if you are in the middle of Cape Town, go find out who your state vet is. If you do a CPR course, they're going to tell you have the ambulance number on your fridge. Because if the popo hits the fan, it's very difficult to remember who you have to phone. But if you have the number on hand, you don't have to remember, oh, what did Dr. Mar just say? What website do I have to go look at? You have the number. So have your state vet's number. The moment you suspect you have foot and mouth disease, if you see any lesions in the mouth or the feet and you're uncertain, phone the state vet. Rather be proactive and they come out and they're like, oh no, it was just thorns. It's not foot and mouth disease. Don't stress. Rather have that, that you overburden them with false reports and then have a case simmering for weeks and then you're affecting your whole community. So phone the state vet the moment you suspect you have foot and mouth disease and then they can assist you. I used to be a state vet. The farmers treat you as if you are to destroy their farm. That's not what state vets do. We control a disease when you're a state vet. And that is to assist the farmer to get rid of a disease as soon as possible. So my first piece of advice, know who your state vet is, have their number and phone them when you suspect the disease. And then biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity. That's the only way that we're going to win this disease. I think Didi missed the last two, biosecurity, biosecurity. If we put that first and foremost, and not just with cattle, but with everything, with all livestock, with all your farming activities, be it chicken, pigs, you will go far. As my parting shots, I am grateful for this platform. Thanks for all the pledges and the support that you are affording government. We cannot control diseases on our own. We need to hold hands. It is our responsibility to make sure that we do not spread diseases from one place to the next. And I'm hopeful that in the near future, we will again be on the same platform celebrating the end of FMD and hopefully not talking another disease, but something more exciting like how do we then maintain this new health status that we have achieved? And the answer would be, guess what? Biosecurity. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Marjan. I couldn't agree with you more, both you and Dr. Didi Klaassen. 
you know, our battle against um, FMD, it's already showing um, positive results and comes back to that collective responsibility. If everyone plays their part um, at all levels, um, you know, we'll definitely um, overcome this. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Marja, Dr. Didi, our speakers who joined, everyone who joined um, tonight's session. Thank you so much for tuning in. Dawn, over to you. Thank you so much, Duncan, for stepping in as co-host, firstly. <laughs> I don't think I would have done this without you. I'd like to echo the thanks just to Dr. Marja and Dr. Didi Klaas, and I think it's so awesome that in Women's Month, I have an all-female panel. Thank you so much to our listeners. From me, your host, Dawn Numdu. Have a good evening further, and we'll talk about FMD a lot more, and in the same context that Dr. Marja spoke about, hopefully. So uh, that's the end of tonight's discussion. Bye-bye.